Welcome, everyone. Uh, let's pray. Lord, we just come to you into your house this morning to, to worship you, to lift our hearts and our voices, uh, to praise you. Lord, just uh, come, Holy Spirit, uh, rain up on us this morning as we gather as your people. Lord, uh, be with Pastor as he uh, brings your message. Let him speak in your power. Uh, and let us uh, listen with attentive hearts and obedient spirits. We just love you. Um, we just welcome you in this place this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Let's stand and sing. Praise, 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 praise,
We want to welcome our online people this morning, and we want to welcome our visitors also. And if you're a first-time visitor, we have some blue uh, cards in the back pockets of the seats. Um, if you could fill that out and drop it in our offering box in the foyer, we'd appreciate that. We can connect with you and you with us, and you can also share your prayer request on that uh, blue card also. Um, we're going to pray over the offering, but our, again, our offering box is in the foyer, but um, you can also use our GCC app. You can visit our website at www.gardner.church slash giving, or you can mail it here um, to the church at 1040 Old Gardner Road, Slim. Lord, we just um, thank you for your goodness in our lives. You are a great and awesome God. Um, Lord, help us to be um, generous uh, in all of our ways, Lord, especially when it comes to um, giving to you and to your people and to your kingdom and to your work and the ministry that you have for us, Lord. Let's be good stewards of our time and our talent and our treasure. Um, Lord, bless those uh, gifts and tithes as we breathe them into your house. Uh, just uh, use them to further your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Let's stand and sing.
Our reading this morning is 1 Kings 19, 1 through 18. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I have no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate it and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazel, and Elijah will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Renata. You did well with all those names there. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you here this morning. A big welcome to our online church as well. It's good to have you with us. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you that we can uh, come and be in your house this morning. What a privilege. What an honor, Lord, as we consider the, the secret church, the underground church worldwide that has to uh, not be seen as they worship you, Lord. And here we, have, here, here we have your word freely. We can worship freely, and we thank you for that privilege and that honor, Lord. And, Lord, we just pray your blessing on the underground church, Lord, that you would prosper it, that you would grow it, that it would become bold, and that you would use it mighty. But use us mighty too, Lord, we pray. Uh, thank you for your word this morning. We just pray your blessing on it. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come afresh upon us this morning, Lord. I pray the words of my mouth and 
the meditations of each of our hearts would be pleasing to you, Lord. You are our rock and our redeemer. We lift you up, we praise you, and we ask for your help. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we saw Elijah on fire, literally, well, not him literally, but we saw the, the, the altar coming on fire. We saw him in this place of strength as God gives him strength. We see him defying the evil king Ahab. Ahab, he wanted him dead. And, of course, his evil deathly queen Jezebel and her 850 prophets. We see Elijah strong against all of them, coming against them, defying them, right? We see him further defying the laws of nature as he saturates that altar with water, right? And then, of course, we see him standing in victory as the Lord sends fire down on that altar and licks everything up around it. Then the people declaring the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Well, then after that, we may, may wonder, Elijah orders that the prophets of Baal be killed. We might wonder, why would he do that? But we've got to understand that those prophets had caused the death of many people. Those prophets have been the ones who had influenced the death of many infants, possibly put those infants on the altar to their god Baal. Those prophets had killed the prophets of, of God, some of them at least, and had killed many innocent others. But can you imagine Queen Jezebel in this place? Not only has her so-called god Baal become a laughingstock in the eyes of the nation when he didn't respond and the god of heaven responded, but on top of that, she no longer has these prophets of Baal. Can you imagine her fury? So what does she do? Whether well, she puts a bounty on Elijah's head, he is a wanted man, right? He's a wanted man, and he runs. As I said, last week we saw Elijah in a place of strength as he ministers powerfully uh, in the power of God. But this week, in a sense, we see his weakness. We see his frailty. We see his humanness. You know, in a strange way, I kind of like that. I kind of like that. I like seeing the humanness of, of, of a person, right? Those people that we revere, we put on a pedestal. Even pastors, right? We do that with pastors. We do that with the retired pastors. We do that with celebrity pastors. We do that with elders. We, it's easy to put people on a pedestal. But we're all gloriously human. And we all sometimes gloriously fail. Right? Sometimes even sin. We act in the flesh even though we, we strive to be holy and, and righteous. And as I've said before, don't put me or anyone on a pedestal. Put us on a prayer list instead. Right? Because we need the strength of God rather than relying in our own strength. And this morning, and as a reminder of that, as we look to Elijah. This is what we read about Elijah in James 5 and 17. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I like the way the Amplified Bible expands on that. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours with the same physical, mental, and spiritual limitations and shortcomings. And wasn't that the case? We see that very much this morning. The same physical, mental, and spiritual, not only limitations, but also shortcomings as well. And you know, as we look at this narrative this morning before us, it, it serves as a good reminder. It serves as... Something we need to be mindful of as we look to Elijah. Firstly, we see last week he really was on this mountain high spiritual experience. Right? Everything was good. He was in the power and the victory of God. His faith was firm. The people had turned back to God. I mean, what was not to love about that? Talk about a spiritual high. But following that spiritual high comes a spiritual low, doesn't it? And that's something to be aware of, something to be mindful of in our lives. I don't know if you've had those spiritual highs before. The wonderful places to be in, where we're exulting in the victory of God, where our faith is firm, where nothing can move us, where God is doing amazing miracles. But then sometimes straight after those mountain highs, those spiritual highs, sometimes we're led into the, into the valley. Sometimes the evil one takes us there, right? He's keen to do everything that he can to, to trip us up, to, to bring us uh, flat on our faces. But even the Lord may lead us into those valleys, those proverbial valleys in our lives. Sometimes that might be because of pride. I don't know about you, but I find myself, it's very easy to, get, to go into that place of pride, especially when we're exulting in those spiritual victories. And it's very easy for us as, as human beings to take, that, that, to take that victory and almost claim it as our own rather than looking to God and saying, God, it's yours. Right? 
The sage reminds us, though, doesn't he? In Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride is one of those worst things that we as God's people can have in our souls. The Lord knows that. The Lord wants to bring us into that place of a beautiful soul, a humble soul again, and we may just go end up in those valleys as a result for a time, for a season. Right? There's only one who should, the, the, the glory belongs to, and who is that? God, as the psalmist says, Psalm 115, verse 1, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name. To your name be the glory because of your love and your faithfulness, right? So the Lord may lead us there. He may allow us into the valley for a time. I don't believe pride was Elijah's problem, right? I mean, last week we see him proclaiming the supremacy of God, and I believe he had a humble heart. But Elijah's proverbial valley was caused by something else that we need to be aware of. And that is what I call circumstantial triggers. Those different circumstances in our lives that can easily, they're not favorable circumstances for us at least, but those circumstances that can easily lead us into a compromised mental and and emotional well-being, even spiritual well-being, physical well-being as well. We see certain circumstantial triggers trigger uh, Elijah into this emotional slump where he wants to even die from that place. The first of these circumstantial uh, triggers is fear. And more specifically, fear of Jezebel. Fear of Jezebel, right? We see in our passage this morning, verse 2, it says, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely. If by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them, that is the dead prophets of Baal. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Now, understandably, Elijah, like all of us, we wouldn't care to be under the wrath of Queen Jezebel of all people, right? It's understandable that he would run. The great irony here, of course, is that he doesn't care to die under Queen uh, Jezebel's hand, but he does want to die. Right? If we take a look in verse 4, it says this, Elijah went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, but sat under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Ever been there before? I've had enough. There's just so much, whatever you want to call it, out there. So much going on in my life. So much darkness out there. Lord, I have had enough. I give up. I've had enough. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. So not only do we see the circumstantial fear related to Jezebel here, but we also have, and in some senses, the circumstantial despair uh, triggering this compromised well-being of his as well, where he wants to even die. We see in, in our narrative this morning, twice God asked him the following question, verses 9 and verse 13, what are you doing here, Elijah? It's a good question. Then in verses 10 and 14, I don't know if you noticed, but he says exactly the same thing both times. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Right? So here we see Elijah despairing really of two things here. The first is a despair at the spiritual state of the nation. Right? All he sees is the Israelites rejecting God, reje- rejecting the covenant, smashing down the altars of God even killing the prophets of God. He has this despair as he, as he scans the spiritual state of the nation. And friends, you know, sometimes we may have that same despair as we look at the state of our nation. The days don't seem to be getting lighter. They seem to be getting darker. And it's easy to be in that place of despair. It's easy to look around and see all, all, all the things going on in different places, different leaders, all kinds of stuff going on, and it's easy to get into that slump of despair. Well, I encourage us to do two things. To stand up for truth, but also to get on our knees and kneel. The church not only needs to rise, it needs to kneel. And it needs to do that daily. It needs to do that daily. When we find ourselves in despair at the state of the nation, right, it's easy to fret. It's easy to, to, to be in this place which leads us into sin. The psalmist says in Psalm 37, verse 8, do not fret, it leads only to evil. I've got to remind myself of that all the time. 
Because it's easy to be in that place of despair. It's easy to be in that place of fretting. But that place of fretting causes us to, to act out compulsively, to react, right? Even to sin in different ways. And we know where to take our despair, don't we? We know where to take our despair. Get on our knees and, and, and take it to, to the God of heaven. But if we take a look at Elijah again, he also despairs at something else here. And what's that? He despairs that in his mind, at least, that he's the only believer, the only lover, the only server of God that's left. Right? He thinks to himself, there's no one else God loving and serving you. There's only me, little old me. We get a sense of that several times in our passage this morning. And even in last week's passage, before he and the prophets of Baal prepare their respective sacrifices, this is what he says to the people, verse 22. Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. And then, of course, there are another 400 prophets to the goddess Asherah as well. You know, as a prophet, God had revealed a lot of things to Elijah, but it seems that he's completely oblivious that there's any other believers, followers of God that are left in, in the nation. And we'll get to that in just a bit. But here we see Elijah really in such a dire place, don't we? Right? Phys think about mentally, emotionally, he's soaking in fear and despair. Spiritually, he feels alone and, and isolated, and physically, he wants to die. And you know, friends, it's, it's easy for us to become into places of weakness too, if we're honest about it. Right, it's easy to put on that, especially for us guys, that macho malexterian and kind of just pretend it's the, it's not, the problems aren't there, no, we're okay kind of thing. But it has a way of catching up with us one way or another. But rather than trying to run away from our problems as we see Elijah doing, or wallowing in our misery as we see Elijah doing, or even, God forbid, wanting to die, some of us might have even been there before. But I encourage us to be mindful, to be aware of these two different things here. The mountain high sometimes go into the valley. And it's okay when we're in a valley. Why? Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. Even when we're in the darkest valley, we have no need to fear. We have no need to despair. Because God is with us, and we're promised that. But be mindful of those places so we can cry out to God. But also be mindful of those circumstantial triggers that can lead us to, to those places of compromised mental and, and emotional well-being. Those emotional slumps that we see Elijah experiencing here. Cry out to God. Of course, Elijah doesn't do this. Elijah just wants to die. But what I love here is that God reaches out to him. What I love here is God reaches out to him. God loves you. He 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 loves you. I cannot say that enough. If there's one message in all of Scripture, it is that God loves you. Right? It's not like, I don't know, if, if, if for ladies especially, you used to have those daisies. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. No, it's not like that. It's not a guessing game with God whether he loves me or he loves me not. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And with Elijah, he loved him. He, he reaches out to him, even though Elijah doesn't want to be reached. Even though Elijah just wants to die, God reaches out to him. Even though Elijah is in this place of fear and doesn't talk to God. Even though Elijah is in this place of despair and doesn't reach out, God reaches out to Elijah. And I love that, that God will always reach out. Even when you don't want to reach out to God. Right? God loves you. And here we see in his great love, he reaches out to comfort and to strengthen and sustain Elijah, the God of all comfort. Paul says these words, 2 Corinthians 1 from verse 3, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Don't you love that? He reaches out to you. He reaches out to me. He reaches out to Elijah here in our passage. And so what I want to do the rest of our time this morning is focus on three different comforting graces, how God reaches out and how God comforts Elijah in this place of great turmoil. The first of these is God's provisional comfort, right? 
God reaches out to him with provision. Don't you love here that God doesn't scold Elijah? He doesn't say, suck it up, buttercup. All right? I don't know if you have the saying here, but in New Zealand we say, pull your socks up. Which is a terrible thing. We had to do it as, at, high, at high school. <laughs> or get back on the saddle or whatever it is, right? I mean, yes, there is a place for that kind of pep talk. There is. There is a time when we need to get back into the saddle again. But God knew that was not what he, that Elijah needed here. Elijah just wanted to die. He didn't need a pep talk. He needed God. He needed God's provisional grace. And this is what we see here. Let's go to verse 5. Then Elijah lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals in a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. Sometimes the journey may be too much for us. And allow God just to, to saturate your soul with his comfort in, in whatever way. The journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. So what does, Elijah, uh, what does God provide Elijah with here? Food and a nap. Aren't those wonderful things? Aren't they wonderful things? I read the following meme. Excuse us. I just had to share it. This is from Facebook of all places. Author unknown. This is your gentle reminder that one time in the Bible, Elijah was like, God, I'm so mad I want to die. So God said, here's some food. Why don't you have a nap? So Elijah slept, ate, and decided things weren't so bad. Never underestimate the spiritual power of a nap and a snack. <laughs> <laughs> That's Facebook spirituality. I apologize. <laughs> and I don't know that Elijah was mad as much as he was in this place of, of fear and despair. He was in this place of, of fragility and, and desperation. And yes, but food and naps go a long way, don't they? They go a long way. You know, sometimes it's easy to neglect our bodies because we think that the spirit, the soul are, are the spiritual parts of us, right? But God tells us to look after our bodies. And I'm learning that as I get a little bit older. I'm learning that a bit more and more, right? It's important to look after our bodies, right? I remind myself periodically now that, and of course, this is one of my greatest areas of, of struggle is looking after my body. But I remind myself two things. I can serve God more optimally if my body is functioning better and I can be there better for my family if my body is working better right right the body is also spiritual right it's easy to neglect that of course it's easy to be on the other side and become vain or or even idolatrous to our bodies that's not what I'm getting at but it is important to look after our bodies right and God knew that God looks after Elijah's body here for him with this provisional grace Think about the provisional graces that God gives to you every day. What do they look like? Sunshine. Sunshine. Don't you love it? I love the rain this week as well, mind you. It was good. It watered my garden for me. Right. Electricity and hot running water. Electricity and hot running water. Where would we be without those, right? There's people right now who don't have those. What's that? A warm bed to lie in. A warm bed to lie in. Absolutely. What's that? A phone that works. Hallelujah. <laughs> but that phone that works now, Mary D. That's great. Yeah? Not out here. <laughs> what was that? Not in diamond points. Not in diamond points. <laughs> yeah. But all these different provisional graces that we take for granted so often, don't we? And yet the provisional grace is given by God himself. And here we see just the basics made such a difference. Verse 8, it says, So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. I mean, that must have been quite some angel food cake, right? That, that, that empowered him for 40 days and 40 nights. Talk about a superfood, right? But even that number 40 is significant in Scripture. Right, 40 days, 40 nights here and there. It's, it's a number of different places. We see that with the ark. We see it here. We see it with Moses, right? We see Jesus uh, and, the, and 40 years as well. 40 is a significant number. It's symbolic of many things, of testing, of, uh, of transformation, even of victory in a person's life. But here it also talks about him going to the mountain of God, which is Mount Horeb. Anybody know the other name for Mount Horeb? Mount Sinai. And who else was on Mount Sinai? 
Moses, right? He encounters God at Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, the burning bush. And then later on, when he goes, also 40 days and 40 nights, and he encounters God at Mount Sinai, a place of being in God's presence, a God, place of hearing God's voice, right? And a place of receiving something. What was that? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. It's a place of presence, a place of God speaking. And here we see God's second comforting grace to Elijah is his voice of comfort. This is a place where he goes into his presence. It's a place where he receives the voice of God. Coming back to the question that God asks Elijah twice, what are you doing here? It's not a, it's not a question of condemnation. It's not a question of accusation. It's a question which invites soul searching. And especially when we find ourselves in those places of funk, Right? where maybe we are possibly out of God's will even. It's a good question to ask ourselves, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? It invites introspection. It invites soul searching uh, in our lives. But then we go to verse 11. Uh, the Lord said to him, he said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. I love that, that, that part there, in the presence of the Lord. It implies that he had not been in the presence of the Lord. He'd been in his own little personal valley, his own personal wilderness experience. He had not been in the presence of the Lord. He had not invited the presence of the Lord. He'd been battling everything on his own. And where did that take him? To a place where he wanted to die. The Lord invites him to come into the presence. Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. I love that, don't you? I even get goosebumps as I think about this encounter with God because it's possible that Elijah had got used to seeing God in the dramatics. Used to seeing, hearing, and experiencing God in the dramatics. I mean, just last week we saw how he'd called fire down from heaven. Talk about dramatic. Right? But here God isn't in the dramatics. Yes, there's turbulence all around Elijah, perhaps reflecting the turbulence of his own soul. God isn't in those hurricane force winds, is he? Right? Some of us know about the hurricane force winds this last week with loved ones, right? On the East Coast. God wasn't in those hurricane force winds. God wasn't in the earth shattering earthquake either. Anybody feel that earthquake this last week in BC? God wasn't in the earthquake either, nor was he in the blazing fire. Where is God? How did Elijah hear from him? That still small voice, that gentle whisper, right? Through that gentle whisper, he hears from God. And you know, it might be easy for us to focus on all of the distractions around us. The turbulence of our times, you might call it. The turbulence of our nation. The turbulence of our politics. The turbulence of crime and corruption. The turbulence of wokeism. The turbulence of rebellion to God on every side. Whatever it is. Sometimes it's easy to focus on the turbulence, isn't it? And to even be derailed by it. And we become even obsessive about it, and then, then we sometimes react in, in, in inappropriate ways. It's easy to focus on the turbulence, and it's possible to fail to retreat into the very presence of God. In that place where we hear that still, small voice of comfort, of hope, of reassurance, of power. There's blessing to be had when we go into that secret place where the Lord is. Psalm, the psalmist in Psalm 91 says this, verse 1, He who dwells, notice that word dwells, to habitually reside in that place. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. He who dwells there. It's not just coming into that secret place once in a blue moon when we're in trouble. 
but he who habitually goes into that secret place. You may remember we did a preaching series on the secret place last year. I think it was summer. You can look that up on on YouTube. We took a look at seven different elements of of being with the Lord in that secret place, coming into his presence with praise and thanksgiving, right? That's the the first thing. I'm trying to remember them. I didn't write it down. Uh, The second one, uh, confession, right? Receiving that daily cleansing, confessing our sins and receiving the insurance from the word that we've been forgiven. The third thing, meditating, hearing from God through his word. Number four, supplication, interceding for the needs of ourselves, our loved ones, the church, the nation, and so on. And then after that, just coming and resting and delighting in the presence. And then after that, what's the next one? Being filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, we need to pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to go out into the world for the day. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the last one, receiving the blessing, the benediction of God. Seven different elements I encourage you to incorporate into your time in that secret place. But I encourage you just to go there. And I encourage you to have a place set aside for that. But of course, you can't go to that place all all day, every day. But wherever you are, you can make that into a secret place with the Lord. Be mindful of His presence. Be mindful that He's with you. Be mindful that He still speaks today with that same comforting voice, that same comforting voice of reassurance and hope. And, of course, we hear that still small voice best where? The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Right? Psalm 119, verse 28, the psalmist says, My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me, how? According to your word. Right? Verse 50 of the same chapter. This is my comfort and my misery that your word has revived me. As we cling, as we know and we memorize, we meditate on the B-I-B-L-E, right? These promises of scripture. They sustain us in those hard places. They nurture us. They revive us. They strengthen us. They comfort us. They give us confidence in the Lord afresh. Even when there's turbulence all around. Well, let's move on to one final way in which we see God reassuring Elijah this morning. And that is through God's relational comfort. Remember Elijah, he thought he was the only one left. Right, the only one left. Right? This trigger of his despair, he thinks that he's alone. Anybody know that song by Akon, Lonely? I am so lonely. I'm not going to sing it for you. (laughs) I have nobody. I'm not going to get that high part. That's just embarrassing, right? (laughs) But this is him. He's Mr. Lonely. I'm Mr. Lonely. If you take a look in the scripture, in just two chapters, a chapter from last week and a chapter this this week, three times, right, he he refers to that. Chapter 18, verse 22, he says, I am the only one of the Lord's prophet left. Chapter 19, verse 10, I am the only one left. Chapter 19, verse 14, I am the only one left. And friends, that might be something that we might need to be careful of in our own lives as well. Right? It's very easy for us to feel, I'm all alone. I'm lonely. I have no body. All on my own. Right? Or otherwise, I'm the only one loving God. I'm the only one serving God. There's no other people of God's uh, around me. I call that Elijah syndrome. I'm the only one left God. Right? You know something? That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Satan has two strategies that he will try to inflict on God's people, the church. One, he will try to cause as much division as he can. And where he doesn't succeed in a united church, he will try to convince you that you are all alone. Nobody loves you. Nobody cares for you, that you're all isolated. Or maybe if you're zealous for for God as Elijah was, that you're the only one who loves and cares and serves and glorifies God. And we rebuke that in the name of Jesus. As you know, God's people are never, never alone. Why? Number one, we always have God, don't we? Our blessed, our beautiful Savior, our Redeemer, our God, our friend. We sung that song, what a friend we have in Jesus. That's the greatest friend you'll ever have. Right? We're never alone because we've got God and we're told in His presence there is joy in Psalm 16 and 11. Right? There is joy. He is the best friend. Cling to Him as He clings to you. But of course we have each other as well. The family of God. The family of God. 
If God's family are truly being God's family to each other, then we never, ever need to feel that we are alone. Never. And if you're feeling alone, why don't you reach out to someone in God's family? Right. Of course, Elijah didn't need to feel alone either. Right? If Elijah had stopped to think about it a little bit, but he wasn't in a place for, for logic at this point. Have you ever tried giving somebody logic when they're all really not wanting logic? Yes. Right? They're in a real tiz somehow or another, and you try logic. It doesn't work. But if, if, if uh, Elijah had tried a little bit of logic here, he would have realized that he was not alone. There were others of God's people there. Think about Obadiah, for example, the palace administrator who was a devout follower of God. And we see in chapter 18 that Elijah had encountered him. And very possibly, Obadiah had told him that how he had rescued a hundred of God's prophets. So that's 101 people just there. Right? And then think about all the people who turned their hearts back to God after they encountered that pyrotechnic display coming down from heaven. Fire coming and licking up that altar. And then people declare, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. I'm sure that some of those hearts were genuine at least. So there's more people who belong to God there. And then God reassures with his comforting voice. God reassures Elijah that he's not on his own in our passage today. Right? Firstly, he tells him about Elisha, who's going to succeed him as the next prophet. Right? Well, Elisha's going to need to become an apprentice, to be a mentor for a while. He's going to be companioning, companioning with uh, Elijah for a while. There's one more who, who knows and loves God. And then, of course, a, a God also talks about 7,000 others who love and serve God. We see that in verse 18. God says, Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Right? There's a lot of people. So even though Elijah felt like he was all alone, that he was the only one of God's people left, right? And he reiterates that uh, three times in just two, two chapters. It wasn't the case. And friends, neither are you alone either. Neither are you alone either. We have each other. It is the, one of the most blessed gifts that God has given to each one of us. It's his family, the church. We're reminded of these words in Hebrews 10, verses 24, 25. The writer of Hebrews says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. As that day it draws near, the world gets darker and darker. We need each other more and more, right? Encourage, motivate. Let's not neglect, right? That's really important. As we meet, that's, it's really important that we not neglect the coming together, the meeting together, the building into each other's lives, the praying for each other, the encouraging each other, whatever it is, right? We need each other. And as we encourage each other, we do so with an eye on the Lord's return. But friends, as we close, Elijah's life is firstly a good reminder to keep each other in our prayers, right? Because even the seemingly super... Super saintly, right? Can be surprisingly weak and fragile. Keep each other in our prayers. But secondly, as we see with Elijah, just know how much God loves you. Just know how much he cares about you. How good is that God that we adore? How good he is. And how he sends so many comforting graces our way, even though we may not be aware of them or appreciate them, or even give him thanks for them. But all these different comforting graces he puts into your life and into my life and into Elijah's life each and every day. We see it with his provisional uh, graces. A, a good nap and some good angel food cake, right? <laughs> what a difference it makes to Elijah where he's able to run for, we're able to, to survive and run for 40 days, 40 nights. Think about that voice of comfort. That speaks and reassures Elijah's soul, but also yours and mine as we look to the word of God, as we go into the presence, into that secret place. But then thirdly, that relational comfort where he gives God's people each other. It's one of the most blessed gifts that we have. Where we can encourage and, and nurture each other in the faith and bless each other's lives, right? As that song goes, I'm so glad to be a part of the family of God, right? How blessed we truly are. Well, let's give him our all in the week to come, shall we? The God of comforting grace. Let's pray.
Lord, we thank you for this reminder as we look to Elijah's life, Lord, the seemingly super saintly, right? Those who seem strong in the faith, and yet all of us are human. All of us can fall. All of us can fail. Thank you for the reminder, Lord. Thank you for the reminder that we need to hold each other up, to pray for each other, to encourage each other. But, Lord, thank you for the reminder that you are always there, that you reach out to us even when we don't want to reach out to you. Even when we don't want anything to do with anybody, but just want and despair to think the worst, to want the worst. But you are there, and in your love and your kindness and your goodness and your care for us, you reach out and you touch us according to the, to the needs that we have, be it our provisional needs, be it our needing to hear your voice in comforting ways, be it the, the, the need for 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 those of your people all around us, Lord. Maybe it's something else. But you are a good God, Lord. You love us and we thank you. You are faithful. We thank you for your great love that led your son to die even on the cross for us so that we may have eternal life if we but believe in you. Oh God, you're good. We thank you for your loving kindness, for your mercy, for your faithfulness to each one of us. And help us to live for you in the week to come, we pray. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our
Well, good morning, and uh, just a quick update on Ukraine situation, that things are continuing to be uh, progress. Uh, this little short video, which I'll go ahead and run, uh, is of the basement. They finished digging it about a while back. Now they've put in the blocks, and uh, it's just sort of the, uh, the scene. I'm not sure where the bomb shelter is, if it's a sub room in there at some point, but they've got the materials, which I think you see in a minute, uh, to put the lid on it. And they're going to then have to leave it for the winter because it's going to get wet. And they're, they thought they weren't going to frame it. That's the farmhouse, by the way, where the construction headquarters in the background. Anyway, they, they've decided to go ahead and frame it. They have uh, somebody from some country coming over that's had a little bit of experience. Uh, and of course, Doug has. His son, who uh, you should be praying for if you haven't already heard about it, he cut his hand while cutting some metal for this and uh, had a pretty bad reaction to, to the uh, medication they gave him, the, the tetanus shot. Uh, and, but he's doing better now. And um, uh, Roberta stubbed her toe and having a hard time getting around and may have broken it. She doesn't know the children are taking care of her now. And Doug's back is bothering him from lifting lamb beams up into and to ship them over there. The, the shipment of stuff we sent has been sorted and, re, and they figured out what they need for the farm home and uh, Yuri picked up a truckload and is somewhere in the 800 miles across northern Ukraine right now passing out stuff. Um, his, usually his run runs all the way to Kharkiv and Kharkiv is over in the far east where the shelling goes on and all that so keep him in your prayers as well. Um, Hopefully in the near future, I'll have a picture with a frame and it'll look like a house. But uh, things are progressing and there's a current sheet out front. With, uh, I think we're about down to 20,000 to hadn't finished paying for this house. Um, so anything anybody has and wants to contribute, great. If you know any movers and shakers, let me know because I'm begging around town. Um, and that's it. Hope everybody's doing well. I saw your note already. I'm going to ask Mike uh, just to say grace for us. But I'd like just to remind you that we, we have potluck uh, straight after this. I invite you all to join us downstairs after that. Mike's going to say grace for us. Thank you, Mike. Lord, thank you for this uh, beautiful, beautiful day. Thank you for this uh, service, for the uh, strong message, and that we should always remember you're with us. And now be with us as we enjoy a meal and the fellowship. Uh, enlighten our conversations and bless the food in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amazing. Join us for that. A couple of other notices. Our uh, prayer minister today is Mary D. She'll be up in front and she'll be more than happy to pray for any uh, prayer needs that you have. Uh, just a reminder, GCC Crouch, that's going to be this Tuesday, 10.30. And if, if, you, if you want to know, just a, a head count of how many people uh, there will be there this Tuesday. Uh, just a couple of people. Any other takers? We got one that's going to us? A couple of people at least. Uh, all right. All right. So uh, if anyone else, if you're online, just to let me know as well about that. A uh, reminder, the Path from Poverty uh, reception is coming up. It's next, not this Wednesday, but Wednesday next week on the 9th. And that starts at 5 p.m. or from 5 p.m. through to 5.30 onwards. And uh, we're all invited to that. So uh, feel free to, to be part of that one. Uh, another reminder about the Fall Festival that's coming up on October the 11th. Uh, that's from 3 p.m. at Heath and Kathy's. And Heath and Kathy, we're praying for you guys this week. Uh, and uh, it's going to be just a whole lot of fun. Of course, we have a couple of trophies here, which uh, may be yours, uh, depending on how good your chili or your dessert is, or both. Right? Uh, so, uh, Lon and, and Becky are the defenders of these, and so let's see how they do with that. But uh, these are up for grabs. Uh, same both ways, but yeah, your name could be on here next, uh, so let's just see how good that chili is, we'll see how good those desserts are, uh, that's going to be a lot of fun, there's going to be apple cider, uh, apple pressing into cider, so bring containers if you'd like some apple cider, and a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of games together, so I encourage you to join us for that. Uh, just another plug for our small groups, uh, there's still a couple where there's room available, uh, go to garden.church slash small groups, or speak to the respective uh, leaders about that. Welcome to be part of those as well. Friends, let's now bow for the benediction. Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face and indeed to smile upon you. The Lord. God bless you. Amen.